everybody for joining us. Sorry, thank you everybody for joining us today uh, for our latest in our Hydroterra webinar series. Um, today we have Gavin Mudd back again. For those of you who were lucky enough to see his previous presentation on mine site rehabilitation, that was very uh, popular with the audience and many, many questions. So uh, Gavin's back again um, with a wealth of knowledge to share. He's uh, spent a career really looking at mine, acid mine drainage and mine site rehabilitation. So today we're looking at a series of case studies from Gavin, as well as a little bit of theory about acid mine drainage. Um, and certainly really appreciate Gavin's support uh, of these webinar series. And it's a it's an honor to be able to share his knowledge out to the broader world, which is a big part of what these presentations are all about. So before we get into it, just a few administrative things. So I'm Richard Campbell, I'm the Managing Director of Hydroterra, and uh, we're responsible for running this webinar series. And Gavin Mudd, or Professor Gavin Mudd, I believe it is, or Associate Professor, I should say, at RMIT, is the presenter today. And uh, Gavin has uh, got a wealth of presentations for, uh, related to the topic of today. In the background, we actually have Michelle, and Marcio is helping out Michelle today with keeping the webinar running. So thanks very much to Marcio and Michelle as well. If you have a question and we love questions, use the Q&A button at the top of your screen and type into that. At the end of that, I will read through those questions and uh, then uh, Gavin and myself will attempt to reply to those. And uh, if we don't get enough time, we will come back to you in an email, but certainly love getting questions and it's a great opportunity to share knowledge. All right, so what's this webinar program all about? We see Hydroterra as having a pretty unique opportunity because of our market reach to help facilitate change by joining, you know, the wisdom of people like Gavin with our uh, market and uh, certainly seems to be very popular with people. So uh, it's, it's great to be able to help do that. Um, so Gavin's uh, going to talk to us about mine rehabilitation and acid and metalliferous drainage. There'll be various case studies, uh, Captain's Flat in New South Wales, Rum Jungle in the Northern Territory, Red Bank in the Northern Territory and Neath Greta in New South Wales. He's got some fantastic photos coming up. Um, and he also wants to share some ideas he has for uh, monitoring of acid mine drainage, in particular on rehabilitated sites. All right, so I think we'll cut to the chase because there's a fair bit to get through. As I said, uh, we're hoping to help enable change and facilitate change through sharing of knowledge and also how technology can be applied to take things forward. More on that. So just for those of you who didn't see Gavin's previous presentation, a little bit on Gavin. Uh, he was one of the first ever environmental engineers to graduate from RMIT back in 1995 having started his career through a PhD on coal ash impacts in Latrobe Valley. He's pursued a very successful academic career at the University of Queensland, Monash University, and then moving back to RMIT. Gavin has been at the forefront of environmental issues in mining for 25 years with his research recognized as the most authoritative around the world. Collaborations include the US Geological Survey, Columbia University, Yale University, as well as participating in research in Europe. He has a huge number of publications. Um, 
He has worked very closely with communities across Australia, including the Indigenous communities, especially with respect to uranium mining, and is very well known for having a strong and independent view, which is why he is such a fantastic presenter. So without further ado, I think we'll hand over to you, Gavin. No worries. Thank you again, Richard. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. <coughs> Hopefully uh, my, my voice holds up. I'm on the, the tail end of a, a rotten head cold. Um, now, I just thought I'd, I'd reuse this slide from my uh, previous talk earlier in the year, which talks about mine rehabilitation. And I think one of the things that's changed is, is really this sense of scale. And I, I think that's one of the things that I think we're finally starting to get our heads around is that since we've developed environmental requirements and management in mining, largely since we introduced environmental law, I guess, in the 1970s, uh, our mines have actually, I think, uh, you know, outpaced uh, our approach like that. And so our mines are getting much bigger at a faster rate than really, uh, I suppose, what our environmental management and things are as well. So we really need to rethink and uh, I suppose supersize our approach to environmental monitoring and other things as well. But the other thing that I guess is perhaps more subtle is that although we are there, there are requirements for mine rehabilitation and so on, uh, it's still not something we've actually done a lot of because most mines are actually still operating uh, and there's very few that have actually been rehabilitated and then monitored for 10 years or more. And the reason why I make that distinction is because we know the problems you know, such as acid and metalliferous drainage, um, sometimes they may not emerge for 10 years or more. Right? And so that we need to make sure we, we're constantly thinking about the nature of the, the risks that are present um, and how we're monitoring for them and so on. And the reason why that's important uh, is because a lot of communities that I've visited and, and, and you know, collaborated with or worked for, uh, they know these stories, they know their local patch, and that's certainly what drives a lot of community concern. Now, it can also be that, and especially in the digital age, of course, the stories and the information and, and photos, um, and I've certainly been uh, a part of this story as well, I guess, it, those photos tell a thousand words. And so there's a, you know, lots of stories. And so people can learn about these types of issues in the same way that we've learned about the tailing dam failures at Mount Polly in Canada, um, which was just before the Samarco failure in Brazil. And then of course the uh, Brumadinho failure a couple of years ago. Okay, so, so really we need to think about not only just you know like how many mines we're doing, but the fact that the scale is so much bigger. Okay, next, thanks Richard. Okay, so just a quick reminder of the basics of, uh, of how AMD works. And, there's lots of variations on the theme and so on, <coughs> but um, largely the initial stages of uh, AMD. So uh, yes, please, Richard, next, just the animations. All right. We know that the initial stages are largely geochemical. And once you get to certainly uh, acidic pH, um, you know, say pH 4.5, microorganisms will uh, take over and then the rates can increase uh, you know, thousands and thousands of fold. But effectively, all we're doing is taking um, some form of iron sulfide, such as pyrite or pyrotite or marcasite. Uh, we're exposing that to water and oxygen in the surface environment. And then what we're producing is, say, goatite, our iron oxyhydroxides, our sulfuric acid, and a lot of heat. Right? And so certainly when I've been around the place and I've been to sites in, uh, in Europe and elsewhere where you can look at the water and uh, it's very, very clear. So that's a good indication that that's uh, quite acidic from the, um, you know, so a lot of particles aggregate together and then you get clear water or that rustic sort of uh, color you get. So this is the database I guess I've been working on now. And this is uh, basically putting dots on the map for every mine around Australia that's you know, mostly over the last 50 years, but also um, a whole bunch before then. And so what I've uh, been building, I guess, is the, the database that then allows us to start to look at, you know, can we reprocess tailings to get critical metals out? So the metals we need increasingly more of for renewable energy, for batteries and uh, other technologies. So that's important. How much waste rock? Uh, and if we compare modern mines over the last 30 to 50 years, there's sometimes a hundred fold more uh, waste rock than we used to mine and so on. So that scale is completely different. All right. The other thing of course is uh, the extent of rehab. And so uh, by going through, you know, basically uh, assessing each dot on this map, we can start to build up a database of uh, rehab. So, so today I want to talk about just a small number of sites, sites I know, you know quite well and have visited. So if we look at these, we just remove all the rest of the dots and just look at the first one, which is our Captain's Flat. So, and that's just down near, uh, uh, near Canberra, of course. The other one, as the, the old Star Trek line goes, everything I learned, I learned from Rum Jungle. 
And so when I first started looking at, um, yep, thanks Richard, um, when I first started looking at a lot of these sorts of issues and especially during my PhD and looking at you know, mining conferences and the, the, the journals and so on, Rum Jungle in the late 90s was promoted as a successful case study. And so I was always interested in like, well, how successful and that's only been 10 years since the rehab was done. So I guess that's one thing I've always been interested in is like, well, what was done, how successful was it and so on. And we'll, uh, um, we'll come back to that story. And other sites I've been to is uh, Red Bank, which I, I still feel is probably one of the most polluting sites I've ever been to. And it's uh, much, much smaller than uh, both Captain's Flat and uh, Rum Jungle and uh, many other modern mines. And yet the impact is uh, rather extreme, as we'll see. And then some small scale sites around Neath Greta, which are just a I think a good, interesting community story around how the community approaches these types of things as well. So next, thank you. So let's talk about Captain's Flat. And it's uh, in some ways, it's a name that's long forgotten. It's an old mine, it, uh, mainly had its uh, two phases in the late 1800s, which is pretty small, only a couple of hundred thousand tonnes of ore, but uh, there was water pollution left over. So when the ACT was actually uh, carved out of New South Wales, um, there were specific causes put into the legislation making sure that New South Wales protected the, the Molongoi River uh, and it didn't impact on uh, Lake Burley Griffin, for example. The Molongoi River that flows through Captain's Flat goes down and then uh, around to the west and uh, through Canberra. And the Lake Burley Griffin is, of course, a dam on the Molongoi River. So when we look at uh, the, the more modern era, there was a sort of a modest scale mine that was operated at Captain's Flat and it processed you know, roughly, uh, you know, I suppose, a quarter of a million tonnes per year and lead, zinc and copper and associated gold and silver. All right, and so it was pretty modest, only you know, about just over four and a quarter million tonnes of uh, ore processed. In total, something like about 1.2 million tonnes of waste rock, um, about 1.5 million tonnes of concentrates were exported, um, leaving about 2.7 million tonnes of tailings. There were some sort of small tailing dam collapses in the early years of the modern mine at uh, Captain's Flat. Uh, that certainly got attention. Uh, but the, uh, the bigger problem was really this long-term constant uh, discharge of acid mi and mine drainage into the Molongo River. And that was both from the tailing dams accidents, but also the direct discharge of liquid waste from the process plant or the mill, uh, as well as all the other uh, mine drainage points. Being in, a, in, the, in the hill, there were some drainage um, pipes uh, drilled from to drain the underground mine so the mine could keep operating and get rid of the groundwater, so to speak. And so that was causing very significant impacts on the Molongo River. And what was known is that, especially by the time you get to the late 60s, there were some studies that were done um, by uh, you know, um, scholars at the Australian National University that showed you were getting zinc all the way down into Lake Burley Griffin. And so it started to become this uh, really contentious site about, well, what is the extent of water pollution associated with mining? And so um, eventually, of course, in the, uh, the mid-70s, there was some uh, new research done or some studies done and there was rehabilitation work done to stabilise the uh, the waste rock dumps and the tailings dams, uh, and there's been minor works done uh, at times ever since. And so it is one of these sites where we actually have uh, various uh, assessments done ever since. So it's one of those few that we actually have more than 10 years of monitoring, maybe not continuous and, and so on, but we at least have a, a sense of actually there. So let's uh, go to some photos. Thanks, Richard. So, about uh, six years ago, um, my wife was going to a conference for as part of her PhD work in Canberra. So, um, so as you do, we we uh, took a little field trip down to Captain's Flats, about an hour's drive. So the top panorama photo, so you can see from where the old process plant is there, and you can see some of the old infrastructure. But if you look down to the uh, left, you can see the, uh, the the water supply dam that actually supplies the water for the town of Captain's Flat, and then you can see some of the uh, the southern dumps there as well. So if you look. On this, you can see these sort of dumps on the ridge there. Now they were covered with uh, you know, um, putting our soil covers in place during the 1970s, uh, but we can see these areas of bare soil, and I'm not quite sure whether that's just uh, you know a bit of random um, and a lack of growth there, or whether there's capillary action that's uh, uh, causing a, a lack of growth. Uh, I'm not sure. <clears throat> so that's sort of looking um, towards this way down here. <clears throat> so if we go. You know, you walk along the sort of road there. Hang on, Richard. Yep, thank you. Um, if we walk along the road there, we can see you've got the, the, the tow drain at the bottom of one of those uh, tailing dam cells, and you can see the acid mine drainage that's still uh, emanating out from that. And so, uh, you know, certainly on the top in this other panorama photo here, <coughs> you can certainly see that the, yeah, it looks stable from an erosion point of view. There is grass there. There are certainly some cattle that 
you could see um, in the distance as well. But um, so it certainly seems physically stable, but we've still got this tail, I guess, of acid mine drainage. Now this photo in the middle here is quite important. That's basically looking, say on the road here and looking towards these sort of Northern dumps here. And what we can see down here, we can see the, the pipe. This is one of these discharge pipes from the old underground mine uh, sort of complex and so on. Uh, and again, evidence of uh, acid mine drainage. And again, another one at the back here. So these sort of two monitoring points here, the, or discharge points here, uh, we can see here in this photo. But certainly when you look at the Malongo River, it certainly doesn't look to be you know, heavily impacted anymore. But I guess there's now going to be this long tail of a low level of uh, acid mine drainage for a long time until basically all the pyrites consumed. Thanks, Richard. Now let's jump to the, the next case study. And, and again, I, I, I say sort of somewhat cheekily, but certainly you know, true, is that a lot of what I've learned has been um, from Rum Jungle. How, um, you know, why did the problem develop? How was it rehabilitated and why has it failed? Uh, and if we think about Rum Jungle, it uh, used to be a very famous name in Australia. It was uh, basically our first major uranium mine that supplied uranium for the nuclear weapons programs of the uh, early Cold War era. Right? And so um, then about a, uh, uh, two thirds of the production was then also stockpiled um, in uh, Sydney at the uh, nuclear complex at uh, what we now call Ansto. Right, so that's its history. So it's actually a military project. It wasn't actually a normal um, our mining company that operated a, um, in a, a, pro a mine for profit. It was a mine purely for a military purpose. So the uh, leftover sort of waste, I guess, from that era is just over a million tonnes of uh, uranium tailings and uh, about two thirds of a million tonnes of uh, copper tailings or heap leach pile material and about 17.5 million tonnes of waste rock. Now, by the time the mine closed, it was uh, infamous, and I really do mean infamous, as a severe site of uh, acid mine drainage. So uh, let's have a look at that. Next, Richard. So we can see the, um, the basic mine layout on the left here. So we can see um, the, the main pit here. It's what used to be called uh, White's Pit after Jack White, the prospector that named or that found the original uranium minerals, but um, the Canarican and uh, Wawai people uh, uh, prefer that to be called main pit, I guess. They, they certainly have their reasons not to call it white. But um, of course, I see the Dyson's open cut here and the, uh, the intermediate um, you know, open cut, which was basically for the uh, copper heap leach uh, project. All right, so we can see the large waste rock dumps associated with each of those and certainly the other uh, heap leach pile in the middle here. Over on the side, on the northern end up here is the old tailings dam area. So that's where tailings just used to be discharged to a floodplain. Uh, one of the things that I guess is uh, yeah, always uh, curious is that the uh, acid liquors from the uh, process plant were just discharged onto that floodplain. Um, and there were times, it's well documented, that the liquor would just vanish into the ground. And uh, we now know, of course, that's related to the dolomite and i.e. solution channel. So if you put acid onto a, um, an alkaline rock like that, you will eat away the, uh, the alkaline rock, of course, and create solution channels. And so those solution channels look like they were um, basically gobbling up that liquid waste. All right, so, <clears throat> so we can see some photos from before the rehabilitation works. Um, clearly not a healthy looking environment. Thanks, Richard. Now, one of the reasons why I guess Rum Jungle did attack, uh, attract so much uh, attention is not only just because it was a, a severe case of uh, acid mine drainage, but a lot of people in the, in the 1970s were, were asking the question, well, if Rum Jungle as a uranium project causes this much damage, we don't want the range of uranium project. Uh, now, though there's some technical differences there, Rum, Rum Jungle uh, is largely a base metal ore body that happens to have a bit of uranium in it, whereas the range of uranium deposit is a, is a uranium deposit. Um, and so it doesn't have the sort of anywhere near the degree of sulfides. And it's also got a lot more alkaline rock in there that can uh, buffer against that. So there are some key differences there, but Certainly there's been uh, sulfides form inside the tailings at Ranger, which is uh, another issue. But uh, what that meant was, is that in order to create confidence in the Ranger Uranium project, the Australian government, um, especially after sort of studies uh, investigated Rum Jungle um, that were done by the um, Atomic Energy Commission and also CRA, the, I suppose the company that had uh, operated Rum Jungle under contract, had basically said, well, yeah, we can rehabilitate and we can develop an approach there that should reduce the metal loads and achieve a good ecological recovery. And so that was funded uh, largely to uh, hopefully demonstrate some confidence that we can achieve rehabilitation. <clears throat> so the basic work that were done is the floodplain tailings were dug up and consolidated into the old Dyson's pit. And so that was then 
uh, filled, uh, uh, the remaining uh, void was filled with waste rock and then soil covers put over the top. Um, the waste rock dumps themselves also had soil covers put on. Um, and, and again, when I was you know, looking at the literature in the, in the late 90s, it was widely promoted. And certainly uh, like that last week, I put together a conversation piece uh, on Rum Jungle because it's just been funded again for another round of rehabilitation. But certainly in the late 90s, it's, uh, it was promoted as successful. We've done the job, it's worked. And uh, I think it certainly won some engineering excellence awards and things like that as well. But by about that same time, though, um, some of the other work which has now come to light was showing that actually the covers are failing uh, and that there's two reasons for that. And, you know, the first one, in some ways, we didn't have a, 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 a sophisticated engineering understanding of unsaturated flow and how to design covers uh, for problems such as acid mine drainage. And from a, a theoretical point of view, if we go back to our geochemical reaction, uh, we take sulfide, iron sulfide, add water, add oxygen, and then we get, you know, um, the rest is history, so to speak. So from an engineering point of view, if we can isolate water, keep it dry, or we can isolate oxygen um, or both, um, then largely we completely reduce and uh, hopefully uh, prevent acid mine drainage and the, the sulfide oxidation process from proceeding. And so in some ways, the, the flawed engineering, we now know that we should have built much, much uh, more sophisticated covers and thicker covers. And so we, uh, in some ways that's forgivable. We didn't really understand the uh, nature of how to design covers to deal with uh, and make sure that we've got covers that stay saturated and therefore prevent oxygen diffusion getting into the underlying waste rock. The other one though, I think is not forgivable. And the covers were supposed to be uh, 1.5 meters in total. Uh, and in many places they were built um, to one meter or 1.2 meters, and they use the wrong types of soil. So they use soils that were more reactive, uh, high shrink swell capacity. And so in the wet, dry tropics up there, of course, in the dry season, the clays dry out and you get shrinkage cracks opening up. So the first rains coming in the wet season, you get a huge amount of infiltration of water. So not only does that allow oxygen to uh, then uh, enter the waste rock dump, um, you also get a huge influx of water. So you're maximizing um, the, the potential for acid mine drainage. So, and I think that certainly, that shouldn't have been allowed to happen. Right? And so I think there's really, there's two sides to that. That one, you could say, yeah, well, it was a bit the, the design, sure, we, we got that wrong, but that's, that's understandable, but um, it wasn't built properly. And, and that's certainly, uh, yeah, that's not understandable. So um, about a decade ago, the uh, Commonwealth government, the Australian government started funding more studies to say, well, obviously we need to do something else. We need to do another round of rehabilitation. And so those uh, showed that yes, there's um, the extensive AMD has come back again. Um, and this time, uh, a lot of the work that has been done and uh, especially in conjunction with uh, groups like the, uh, the Canarican and the Warai traditional owners, um, this time we're going to do pit backfill. And the basic theory, and this is something that certainly I've advocated um, at sites like Rum Jungle and, uh, and elsewhere, uh, by doing pit backfill, you've got plenty of water in terms of groundwater, uh, but the, uh, I suppose the solubility of oxygen in water is considerably less. So instead of having say 20, 21% or you know, 200,000 odd parts per million of oxygen in air, we're now going down to say eight or 10 parts per million or, or milligrams per litre of oxygen in water. And so that peak backfill, uh, although it's not an absolutely perfect solution, it's certainly, um, I would argue, orders of magnitude lower uh, long-term environmental risk. And so we really reduce uh, the, the role or well, the potential for AMD. Right, and so now they're looking at, I've just gone through an environmental impact assessment process uh, and uh, about uh, last week or the week before, I think it was, there was now, now the funding committed to in the federal budget for an 11 years uh, project at Rum Jungle. Thanks, Richard. So this is what a rehabilitated mine is, is, is not supposed to look like. So you can see here the photos from 2004, it's sort of the first time I got to visit Rum Jungle. Um, and again in 2007, so you can see some more groundwater pores there. This is the, uh, the finished river there. And uh, it's certainly not supposed to look like salts and, uh, and full of colors like this. And so these colors are your ions that you get from the sulfide oxidation. The greens can be associated with copper or sometimes other chemistry. Uh, but the thing that's important with this uh, top middle photo is, um, is one, you can see the yellow, uh, and I suppose tainting of the leaves in that tree there. So it's obviously really struggling, um, but also, you can notice the flow that's coming out of that waste rock dump. So clearly there's significant water inside that waste rock dump that's coming out. But the other important thing is that the, the salt, which is basically 
I suppose our acid mine drainage. So the, the, the acidity dissolves up salts as well as heavy metals and so on. And this would be several milligrams per liter uranium here. All right. And so when you're looking at that, it's coming from up the side of the waste rock dump. And so it's not just coming out at the very base of the waste rock dump in a, in a tow drainage or you know, seepage interception system, it's coming up from the sides. And there's certainly other photos I've got which show it uh, stretching up even higher uh, up the side of that waste rock dump. And so what that shows you is that in order to do that, you must have a very saturated waste rock dump that's got a lot of water sitting behind it. And so that water is basically saturating the side wall there and causing that seepage. So it, it shows you that you're getting so much water in through that cover that the uh, it's basically, a, a, yeah, it's been a significant failure, I guess. And so hopefully, um, you know, we're all hopeful, I guess, that the, the new round of rehabilitation uh, will finally address that. And uh, by pit backfill, um, for the most of the waste rock, uh, or a lot of it, um, will substantially reduce this problem into the future. Thank you, Richard. Now, Red Bank, as I mentioned, I think it's uh, you know it's a really small site, literally two and a half million tons of waste rock, but it was only operated for a, <coughs> a couple of years as a as a modern mine. It was pretty small and boutique even for its day. Uh, <coughs> uh, Bill Masterson was a, a hermit, I guess, that had lived in the caves nearby with some uh, Aboriginal women. Um, and he basically used to mine a bit and take it down to Mount Isa every now and then and get get, get some money, I guess. But um, and so in the 90s, it was developed as a as a modern mine, uh, but only lasted two years before it went bankrupt. And there was no bond. And I think that was uh, it's an interesting case study because the law said there was supposed to be a bond. And I'm not saying it was supposed to be even 100 percent of the rehabilitation cost, but there wasn't even any bond whatsoever, let alone whether that bond would have covered the, the actual works required. Now, eventually, of course, a new company became the owner, and that was just simply called Red Bank Copper. And they were certainly trying to develop it, and they wanted to develop it as a way to try and say, well, let's get this AMD under control, right? Because it was uh, becoming a really sort of infamous site like, um, like Rum Jungle. But, but again, if we think about the numbers, it's uh, almost an order of magnitude lower in its mine way. So two and a half million tons versus, say, uh, you know, uh, Rum Jungle, which is around about 20. All right, and so a friend of mine, Charles Roach, who's uh, with the Mineral Policy Institute, um, he visited the site in 2010 based on some uh, when he visited the community at MacArthur River. He said, "Oh, I think it's I think it's bad. I, I can't really judge." But and so we were lucky enough to be able to uh, plan a trip um, to visit Red Bank in uh, 2011, part of our Mining Legacies project, I guess. And so um, the photos that we're able to take of the the pollution there. I think were, were really instrumental in actually helping to get some change in the Northern Territory. Russell Ball, who was a, a senior, um, I suppose, uh, a bureaucrat within the department there in the Northern Territory, was able to get what he called the Mining Legacy Fund up and running, <coughs> which is simply like the super fund in the US. It's a 1% levy on operating mines in the Northern Territory. And that way, the Northern Territory government has the funds to deal with a lot of legacy mines. Uh, and at that stage, of course, Red Bank was not declared a legacy mine. It was only a few years later when it was really obvious that uh, the company Red Bank Copper was never going to be able to um, find the funding to develop Red Bank. And the uh, NT government basically called it in and um, cancelled the lease. And so now Red Bank is actually declared an abandoned mine. Uh, but I think that was one of the nice things that came from that is that 1% levy. And so I think Russell Ball deserves a lot of credit for that because he overcame his minister, his uh, department and the industry to implement what is good public policy. So if you look at the photos here, this is some photos and these are um, from uh, Mike Fawcett um, in terms of the aerial work. So Mike Fawcett used to run the uh, Mining Legacy uh, uh, program within the department up there in the Northern Territory. And so once they've called Red Bank in, you have to work out how to fix it and how to remediate it. And so we can see here the, the aerial image. So you can see the small pit there, the Sandy Creek pit. Uh, and you can see where they've done the small sort of experimental uh, heap leach pile in the middle there, the old tailings dam. Um, uh, the old process plant. So in the, the Savannah Way is the main road there. And you can see Hanrahan's Creek just on the left there. It's sort of some interesting colours. But the photos on the right also give a sense of, I suppose, what you're actually seeing in the creek. Uh, next, thanks, Richard. So these are some of our photos that we had. So we can see here, one of, one of the things that I think is just absolutely remarkable about Red Bank is you've got this uh, waste rock dump, you're getting seepage into the water table. And with the, the pit being a sink for groundwater, of course, uh, the groundwater is uh, basically streaming in through the side walls of the uh, the pit there at Sandy Creek. It's, um, I've never seen that anywhere else, nowhere near to that extent. You might see you know, some individual seeps and so on, but never 
sheeting right through the whole wall of the open cut. That's uh, rather remarkable. Now, when they did the uh, environmental impact statement for the potential redevelopment of Red Bank <coughs> in uh, 2009, um, we can see Hanrahan's Creek there on the on the, you know, the um, photos on the bottom. Um, that's about 400 milligrams per litre each of aluminium and copper in the creek already. All right, so it's quite um, not quite industrial grade, but not far from it either. All right, and so um, thanks, Richard. Just a little next animation, but um, so that's about pH three. Uh, that we're dealing with there and so um and we'll see i think the the work that's been done they'll probably have to backfill the, the pit and so on at red bank but another site i visited um you know, not long after red bank was the community in the hunter valley the lower hunter um and there were some community members that have noticed that these old mines and i, and I really mean the old underground mines and the, the lower hunter there um not far away from uh, maitland in the neath greta area once you had the groundwater rebound, so the underground mines close, you get the groundwater rebound, <clears throat> and this odd coloured water is starting to emanate out, and so which of course we recognise as acid mine drainage. And so one of the local community members um, had started uh, saying, well, what's happening? These are all long abandoned mines, the companies no longer exist, um, government's not doing anything about it. So, um, so he said about, and we can see on the sort of photo on the right here, the top right, that he said about basically building a lime dosing plant you know just a small little uh, activity you can see the little generators there um, and pumps and so on um and he said about trying to sit, you know, treat the water himself and so um and i think the the thing that's really sad about this is that rather than government going well actually there's a problem here we didn't recognize um and clearly communities that concerned about it because it does impact on the on the you know, the values for recreation and other things downstream uh, let alone the ecological values uh, they actually just said right right well we'll find you instead <clears throat> so we'll find the community member um and and threaten them with legal action if they don't stop so i think that to me is the wrong approach we really need to be saying well actually community have got um obviously a vested interest in protecting their own local patch and i think that's something that's uh, something that really should be celebrated and you can see on the sort of bottom middle photo down the, um here um, but that's the sort of leftover. So he was forced, unfortunately, to, to stop his lime dosing and treatment of that acid drainage and trying to help at least you know, remediate the problem. Um, and we can see the sort of leftover of that there now. All right. So I think whenever um, we hear stories that communities are concerned about mining or opposed to mining, one of the things I've learned is there's often good reason. So and whether it's stories like this, where local members have actually local community members have seen the sort of the legacies that can be left. Um, you know, all, all sorts of other reasons. But I think, you know, to me, I've always sort of tried to think through and engage, well, what's the science? What's the issues there? All right. And so it's, uh, and often there is, there is, there is a reason, there is stories, there is a, a basis there as to where that community concern comes from. Thanks, Richard. I thought I'd add in a bit of a bonus site because it's something at least to give a, hopefully a bit of an international flavor. And if we look at the, with Waters Rand, so that's the, the, the gold area of uh, around Johannesburg, uh, it's, probably mined and processed something of the order of 7 billion tonnes of ore over the last uh, 130 odd years. And certainly um, just under a third of the world's gold has come from South Africa alone. But the legacy is, of course, that several billion tonnes of ore is now several billion tonnes of tailings. And that gold ore also has uh, low levels of uranium in it. And a lot of the mines have long since closed down. So in the, in the West Rand area, west of Johannesburg, those mines largely closed in the 1950s. And so as you've got groundwater rebound, you've now got this groundwater carrying uh, acid mine drainage up into the surface environment. And you've got these old tailing stamps there and you can see there's even trees growing on the side, but hopefully you can also see the, uh, the amount of fine dust that's being blown away from those tailing stamps. And you have communities living right next door. You've got communities like Soweto, um, you've got the other neighborhoods and uh, you know, um, suburbs of Johannesburg as well. Uh, and so you've got millions and millions of people living in a context where you've got this free flowing acid mine drainage. And I, I really do mean down streets and streams of the uh, suburban areas around the West Rand and so on. Um, and that's also impacting on people. So the photo in the top right here is a retirement village that was built literally next door to the photo of this tailings dam. And it was lasted about two years before it was shut down because of course all the dust problems is not the sort of thing you want for a uh, retirement village. So. Um, so again, so in some ways, I think the, the scale problems, I think, you know, sometimes we uh, we talk about our issues in Australia, but I think it's uh, sobering sometimes when you think of the scale of problems overseas as well. All right, so these, uh, these are not small issues to deal with. Okay, next one. Thanks, Richard. So out of all of that, I think we're on uh, in good time. 
But to me, acid mine drainage is still one of the biggest problems <laughs> we've got with mine rehabilitation. There's you know, a whole bunch of other aspects we need to think about with mine rehabilitation, but, but certainly AMD, I think, is one of the biggest ones. And certainly we've come a huge, long way. We've, you know, uh, from sites like Rum Jungle, like Captain's Flat, uh, we've now taught ourselves that, yes, we can get very serious impacts on our aquatic ecosystems, on communities, um, and we need to be really careful in how we go about engineering our um, rehabilitation approaches to sites that um, have acid mine drainage risks. So with sites like Rum Jungle, we've learned that the very simple you know, two-layer cover systems are not enough. They don't work. Right? And so really, we have to go to much more complex multi-layered systems like four, five, or six layers. And so some of these uh, learnings, I guess, are what we'll be applying to sites like uh, um, MacArthur River. And certainly MacArthur River has issues just in terms of operations and uh, managing its uh, acid mine drainage and sulfide oxidation, as well as spontaneous combustion there as well. But um, all right, so Captain's Flat, the simpler um, uh, covers uh, seem to be effective uh, it, for the most part. Like it's uh, certainly not allowing a massive amount of acid mine drainage, but there is a slow tail that's going to be there for a long time. All right. Um, Thanks, I'll, I'll get to that question. So, um, <clears throat> but we know um, it's not, you know, waste rock dumps are not the only source. We can see open cut mines as we've seen at Red Bank, uh, the underground mine, both at uh, Neath Greta, but also in the, in the, the Big Waters Rand in South Africa um, and so on. And we know, you know, from sites, you know, whether it's in Australia or all of the literature internationally, that AMD can last anywhere from decades to centuries or even millennia in places. And we know that from uh, places like the southern part of Spain. All right, so, um, so therefore, we need to be monitoring and we need to be actually looking at this long term. There are other sites that, are, that are, we know about, such as uh, Gijinbung near Tamora, where the site has been relinquished and there's no mining lease anymore. So effectively, that means the New South Wales government is liable for rehabilitation um, you know, issues there. But you've now got an acidic pit water there. <clears throat> right? And so um, now that mine closed you know, 25 odd years ago. But you know, again, how much are we really monitoring and how public is all of that evidence? And so I think one of the, the ideas that I think I certainly, I think we need to be pushing for a lot more is that we really do establish a you know, much, much more sophisticated approach to environmental monitoring and, and assessment of our rehabilitation with respect to acid mine drainage. And that's something that I think, you know, and the, the sites I've talked to today are not the only ones. There are uh, certainly other sites around Australia we could talk about, um, such as uh, Bukunga in South Australia and, uh, and, and many others. Right? But I think what we need to make sure of is that when we're thinking about mining and rehabilitation, and especially with respect to acid mine drainage, we really understand the, you know, the value of that investment in monitoring and, uh, and making sure we use that data to assess the success of rehabilitation uh, or otherwise. Uh, because if we're, if we're not successful, then like Rum Jungle, we still have a liability. We still have a need to come back and spend more money again in the future uh, to keep dealing with the problem. So I think there's, uh, as much as there's a great problem there, that also means there's a great opportunity. So. Uh, but leave it there. Thanks to Richard and the Hydro Terra team, and uh, happy to open up for questions. Cheers. Well, Gavin, thanks very much for that. Uh, it's certainly kind of sobering, uh, particularly that uh, uh, South African experience there with um, what's obviously a massive liability sitting there, causing a lot of environmental impact. Uh, we have three questions at the moment. Keep those questions coming. Um. <laughs> I think that's a good. That's probably that's a, that's a good one. Thanks, Dean. Um, that map and the, the data associated with it is uh, will hopefully be uh, sent off for publication uh, in the very near future. So uh, once that's done, um, uh, certainly it'll, it will become public, and uh, hopefully we'll um, uh, be able to use it going forward for all sorts of work, especially in uh, collaboration with Geoscience Australia and uh, and others as well. So. But yeah, that's a, a good question there. Thanks, Dean. Uh, next question from Ian Rutherford. Um, thanks so much, Gavin. You have shown us some serious examples. Are these extreme or typical of the thousands of abandoned mines on your map? Yeah, thanks, Ian. I think it's a really good question. And I think in some ways, yes, these are extreme examples. Certainly the ones like Rum Jungle uh, are the extreme from, from yesteryear. But in other ways, part of the problem is we don't necessarily really understand, like um, we haven't done a great assessment. And, and I, I often make the distinction between yesteryear mining, which was much smaller. So yesteryear mines were 10,000 tonnes a year uh, of tailings or ore processed, or maybe 50,000 tonnes for a bigger mine. 
and so on. And so the scale was a lot less. And they were typically all underground, so they didn't have large waste rock dumps um, or things like that. And so, um, so a lot of the yesteryear mines, I think, probably don't have the degree of acid mine drainage risks except certain sites. But the problem is, I think, with um, a lot of our modern mines over the last 50 years, is the scale is so much bigger. We're mining a lot more ore bodies that are that do contain sulfides, and so we uh, we haven't done an assessment of actually well how many of them have an acid mine drainage risk, how big is that acid mine drainage risk? Right? If we think of uh, some other examples out there from the literature sites, uh, some of the iron ore mines, <coughs> excuse me, some of the iron ore mines in the Pilbara, for example, uh, are mining billions and billions of tons of waste rock for their billions of tons of iron ore. Now, 10 to 15 percent of their waste rock is uh, highly sulfitic and reactive. It's um, sort of a black sort of a pyritic shale like material. And so part of the reason they identified that is because the explosives were going off early when they were, as they were mining from the mountains and moving down deeper below the water table, they were mining from the oxide or weathered zone in the surface down below the, the um, into the sort of the fresh rock. And so that was where there was um, unweathered uh, sulfides. And so, and of course, if your explosives are going off early, that's obviously a huge, uh, occupational health and safety risk. And so the investigations into that highlighted the fact that they've got very significant acid mine drainage risks associated with that material. And so that's 10 to 15 percent of um, you know, some mines in the Pilbara that are billions of tons of waste rock, which actually dwarfs rum jungle. Like um, so, um, and then you've got other sites like Mount Lyle and Mount Morgan and so on. But certainly the map that I've got and the, that's sort of one of the future assessments I want to be able to do is to actually start to put a, a risk assessment around it, every site for acid mine drainage. So we can actually work out, well, what is typical, what is extreme, uh, how successful are we and where aren't we successful and why and, and so on, and basically do the much more comprehensive assessment that really no one's done yet. And I think there's certainly stories out there we know for different sites, but we've never done that sort of systematic assessment like that. So that's certainly uh, on the cards, but that's, a, that's for down the track. Thanks for that, Gavin. That's, um... Certainly sobering to think of uh, how many sites there are. It's, uh, it's great that you've pulled that together. Um, our next question is from Rajiv Bhavaraju. I hope I got that pronunciation right. What role could selective removal technologies like acid resistant membranes or absorbers slash resins play here? This would add a resource recovery benefit to strengthen the case. Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think that's something a lot of people um, excuse me, have uh, certainly been looking at because if you've got the, the high concentration of metals, the, the exact concentrations and, 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 and uh, I suppose the range of metals that would be present will vary enormously, both even you know, between different mines, but also over time as well. Now, processing of those solutions, you can recover those metals. Now, in some places there's, there's sites I know of where uh, that acid mine drainage is actually used to recover copper. So the, the, the acid drainage is basically allowed to proceed uh, and then the solutions are captured at the bottom of the waste rock uh, piles to uh, capture and then process for copper. And that happens at mines in America. I know of cases in Kazakhstan and elsewhere. Um, so th there's certainly opportunities for that. And that, I think that might be uh, a, a way to help fund the re rehabilitation or the remediation of some of these sites as well, um, or at least cover the cost to, uh, of treatment. So. Um, certainly, it's, it's, there's various te technologies out there, um, solvent extraction and others that can be used, and membranes um, and you know, uh, ion exchange processes. So they're certainly well worth looking at, and, and sometimes they might even be economic. So definitely. Thanks for that one, Gavin. That's that's interesting. I didn't know that there were were sites where you could economically uh, extract that. I suppose it's no different to heap bleach in a in a slightly more uncontrolled fashion. Um, yeah, Plucky Americans terms... called dump leech, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question comes from Eamon Lay. Lie. Most of the treatments shown relate to covering up to reduce the flow rate and dilute slash redirect flow. I suppose this means increasing the duration for monitoring. Is there any thought to chemical treatment to reverse some of the chemical reaction in addition? Yeah, that's actually uh, a lot of the approaches I guess we're focused on in Australia have been very much the engineering approach, which is um, covers and isolation. Right? And so um, now there are other approaches out there, like more recently, those had some interactions with the 
um, Jim Gusek on uh, in uh, America, where he started using bactericides uh, back 25 years ago in America at certain sites, especially small coal sites and things like that. And um, regulators at the time, and, um, and this is something we're, we're following up on, but regulators at the time said, oh, that's a one-off uh, treatment. Uh, you, you're basically, you're putting a Band-Aid on, you're not actually treating the oxidation process. All right. So now he's come back 25 years later and looked at some of these sites and they're, um, they're still working. There still hasn't been any uh, emergence of AMD again at those sites. So um, he, he's certainly uh, looking at that. So I think that's something that I think I, you know, my comment was, oh, it's a one-off treatment. It's not going to work long-term. But um, he said, well, actually, yeah, there's evidence it does. So now whether it's bactericides, whether there's other chemical treatments, there's things like, uh, you know, Borksol is one of the commercial products out there, like taking red mud from an alumina refinery because of the alkalinity in that, that can be used to basically neutralize the acidity. Um, and once you can, if you can maintain a neutral pH, then you don't have the, the uh, preferred uh, chemical environment for bacteria to thrive and really drive the whole oxidation process. So, so I think there's a lot of these sort of technologies and the different treatment approaches. You, you need to understand your site, like uh, uh, Carrington, uh, I think it's called up in the uh, northeast corner of New South Wales has had that, that type of approach used. Um, so I think sometimes they can be very useful and certainly Mount Carrington, the, um, the papers suggest it's worked really well. Um, but again, that was at the time, you know, not long after mining was done. So I'd be interested to follow up again, 10, 20 years later and see whether it's still the case. And that, that's, I think, where we get the great evidence longer term. So, so there's a whole range of both chemical as well as, um, I suppose, bacterial, you know, bactericide or biological processes that can possibly be used as well. And they may still be used in conjunction with a lot of the normal physical engineering approaches as well. But a lot of that is always comes back to understanding your site and, and uh, making sure that whatever design and approach you use is relevant for that site and hopefully works uh, well for that site. So, Gavin, why aren't they being adopted more at the moment? Is it because the, uh, the, there's no money left to do that? Or uh, is it just technology needs to be further developed? Uh, I think it's probably a multitude of factors, I think, Richard. I think part of it is our, um, you know, like as a, just, I'm just admitting my own professional bias. In some ways, I, you know, there's some treatments I expected wouldn't work, and yet there, there is some evidence to suggest that it can. Right? So I think there's certainly that. There's also um, the fact that once the, the mines have gone bankrupt, the companies have gone bankrupt, they no longer exist. So there's no, you know, um, and if there's no bond like Red Bank, um, you know, government's got to find the money from somewhere else, which is why I think the NT policy is a good one. <clears throat> and I think that sort of policy now, whether it stays at 1%, if you rolled it out nationally, or you said, let's put it 0.1% nationally or something. I think if we had a sort of a, you know, a treasure chest, a, a war chest, so to speak, um, to fund a lot of the cleanup of all these old mines, in, including modern mines that have failed in terms of gone bankrupt or things like that, or where we've got our assessments wrong, um, as well as old mines from yesteryear, um, I think we'd be able to deal with a lot of community concern much better. All right. So I think there's, yeah, and sometimes regulators, I think um, they're coming from the same sort of professional concepts as we do. So, so sometimes I think we, you know, I suppose, I suppose I've learned that it's always good to keep a really open mind and, and think about your site, think about what works, what the climate is, what the criteria you're trying to achieve are. You know, in some ways, like Rum Jungle, we've now incorporated cultural criteria into rehabilitation. There's still sacred sites on the Rum Jungle site, so that they need to be protected. Um, all right, so I think there's all of those things we need to, I suppose, keep in mind. Yeah, that's a complicated situation. Uh, yeah. We've got a lot of questions mounting up, so we're going to keep yeah, moving please. on. Um, Dan Evans. <coughs> Hi, Gavin. Great talk. Can you comment on New South Wales legacy mines approach of focusing on minimising off-boundary impacts through risk prioritisation and limited remedial works, given the lack of funding slash insurance bonds for their sites. Yeah, it's that's a really difficult one because it cuts the heart, I guess, of how governments approach this historically. And I think we, we, there are certainly sites where that can work, where you can, and and a lot of it is like, well, there's no people here, so therefore the impacts don't matter. Right? And I think that's problematic. Uh, problematic because it means that we're not worrying about what the environmental impacts are. And a lot of sites, uh, especially the old yesteryear sites, are, are small, right, in comparison to, say, sites such as Katy or North Parks, 
in New South Wales and, uh, and, and, and coal mines, you know, modern coal mines as opposed to old coal mines, et cetera. Right? So I think there's that, that scale difference there, which means that when you're doing a risk assessment of these old mines, you automatically mean because they're small and because they're not necessarily right next to someone's home, uh, the risk comes out as pretty minimal. Right? And I think that that downgrades and basically ignores a lot of the environmental impacts that are going on. Um, but also, and I think, you know, hopefully, as I've been able to show, if we can't rehabilitate you know, the smaller sites like Rum Jungle or, or others, uh, I think it's quite legitimate for community members to say, well, if we can't fix the old sites, how confident are we that our rehabilitation approaches are going to work for our big mega sites? So I think there's, so in that sort of sense, when you're looking at the risk assessment framework, sometimes it's failing to link the sort of the bigger picture that we really need to demonstrate a good success on our older sites and our smaller sites to make sure we have the confidence to deal with our bigger sites. Because if we get it wrong on the big sites, we're not just dealing with, you know, five or 10 or 20 million tonnes of race rock, we're dealing with billions of tonnes at, at, at coal mines and iron ore mines and, uh, and elsewhere. So some good demonstration sites is sort of what you're advocating for there, I think. Um, yeah, absolutely, and exactly what that means in terms of a, you know, a new approach, I guess that's something, um, yeah, the Northern Territory system, I think, is probably a better way to go. Like we have, you have a better funding basis on which to um, to remediate all these old sites. Okay, next question. Keith Osborne, Gavin, can you please comment on how successful passive water treatment processes, both abiotic, e.g. limestone drains, and biotic, such as constructed wetlands, have been? Yeah, I remember during my PhD, we used to have limestone drains at the um, at the Loyang Power Station there, and depending on you know a bunch of factors, but certainly the coating of goatite that you would get from precipitation would cover the limestone, and then you'd get very little contact between the uh, the acidic uh, water and then the, the actual limestone, and so the um, you'd have to constantly come and either you know, scrape off the the goatite or um, uh, or crush up the limestone, so you're basically creating contact again. So. Limestone drains can work, but they require a lot of active uh, maintenance and, um, and careful attention. Um, biotic wetlands can certainly work, and there, there are examples out there in the literature. Um, but again, I mean, I think they're, they're putting band-aids on the problem. And so I think whether they, they may still be an appropriate approach, the um, example, uh, probably one of the best examples of, um, of uh, not so much uh, a biotic um, you know, wetland, but uh, just a, a treatment um, plant was actually at the old Golden Cross mine in New Zealand, where um, they've got a fully automated water treatment plant that treats the, uh, the, the modest amount of acid mine drainage that comes out of the uh, waste rock dumps there and the old underground mining. Uh, and so that, that's you know, directed into this water treatment plant and treated so that they meet the um, water quality criteria downstream. So uh, there are certain examples out there that you can find of, of, of all of these types of things saying that they can work. Um, but I guess you have to balance up uh, how much active maintenance or operations are required versus the criteria you're trying to look at and, uh, and so on. And there are sites like Equity Silver in, um, in uh, British Columbia in Canada, which will require hundreds of years of monitoring you know, and stuff. And so you can have these sorts of approaches where you have a treatment system there, uh, but you're looking at a basically a, almost effectively perpetual um, you know, treatment uh, process that you've got to manage. Okay, good answer there, Gavin. I think um, one of the challenges is just uh, the duration these systems need to run for. Um, next question from Andrew Spark. Looks like Andrew's chasing some assistance. We might um, send you an email, Andrew. He is working with an abandoned open cut mine that is full of water and looking for guidance to current treatment strategies. Do you want to just make a broad comment of you know what you've quick comments. I mean, I think a lot of it um, comes down to also, um, <coughs> give me, um, what criteria are you trying to achieve? Right now, I mean, I've seen open cuts in the gold fields in Western Australia that are full of AMD, um, and the normal expectation is, oh, you're in the desert. There's not enough rainfall to drive AMD. Well, there is. There's Teutonic bore. There's uh, you know many other mines I've seen. Um, so it. So I think a lot of the sort of the various treatment strategies depend on well, what are you treating for? Are you treating just to to remove the problem from the open cut? Are you treating so that the water could be reused for agriculture or for drinking water or some other purpose, I think? Um, and again, depending, I guess, on what that purpose is will depend on what treatment strategies might work and so on. But the other thing too, I guess, is, uh, um, is it just to 
how much groundwater um, surface water interaction is there between the water in the pit and the groundwater. They're all the questions I guess I'd be thinking about. Um, but yeah, happy to take that offline and um, talk about that further via email if you like, Andrew. Just before we move on, Gavin, so were you involved at all with the, there was in Western Australia, they had a, uh, a program called something like the Open Pits Irrigation Program, where they were looking at using these pits effectively as water supplies for those um, remote areas. Were you involved with that? No, I wasn't involved with that. I've certainly seen some of the literature on that. But, but again, a lot of it comes down to understanding your water quality, understanding what the use you're putting that water to. Um, there's been a lot of work in the Collie Basin, for example, in the old coal mines there, um, where they've had uh, very significant acid water in there, build up in their old uh, open cups there as well. And so they've had to, and again, I think it's a combination of wetlands and uh, understanding the catchment, not just the mine as well. So um, yeah, so there are, there are examples out there, but, um, but that, that, that specific work was not something I was involved with, no. Okay. Um, next question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, hi, Gavin. With large sulfitic waste dumps, do engineered covers just delay the inevitable AMD effects? Ah, uh, that's kind of a trillion dollar question. Um, yes and no. I, I think in many ways, our covers do delay the rates quite a lot. <clears throat> now, I suppose the question then becomes, if you've delayed the rate down to let's just magically say it's 1,000 times lower than it would be without the covers. Um, yeah, and yes, I think as a previous question pointed to as well, does that mean we just, it's just increasing the duration of monitoring we need to worry about? Um, and I suppose that's true to an extent as well, but, um, but effectively it's managing, I suppose, the capacity of our environment to um, absorb those effects or the risks that we have, whether it be to communities or to the aquatic ecosystems and, uh, and so on. So, um, so I think in some ways, yes, they kind of are, but we're at managing that process to making sure that the environmental risks um, are vastly reduced compared to what they would be if there were no covers. All right? And I think it's also you know, part of the reason why in looking at failures like Rum Jungle and, and thinking about that uh, and, and other sites you know, where um, you know, there's these great experts out there like Ward Wilson from Canada and so on that was one of the great innovators in, in developing the software like soil cover and so on to actually allow the design of soil covers for AMD. And um, he's actually gone to the thing, he's like, no, no, I actually have got, he's gone away from soil covers now to look at in pit disposal because um, whether it's erosion or, or other, or sometimes tree roots, um, you can get ways that the, uh, the integrity of that engineered cover uh, can be significantly impacted. So I think um, in some ways, yes. And certainly I argue that I think the best long-term approach is generally gonna be pit backfill. Right, um, and whatever's left, then we have to do with covers maybe. But, um, but again, you know, there's real cost to that, but I think we also need to understand not only the cost of doing that in terms of pit backfill, but also the cost of having to maintain a site with engineered covers uh, effectively in perpetuity. The MacArthur River mine, uh, when it went through its last environmental assessment process, precisely to work out how to manage all of its uh, rather severe acid mine drainage problems and, and associated with its waste rock and so on, uh, it's now put a 1,000 year time frame on rehabilitation. The first time in Australia, I think that's ever been done. And that's largely due to concerns around how long, um, the, how long term this sort of AMD risk is there uh, and so on. I mean, I think really the only other site that would even come close or, or more stringent than that would be the Ranger uranium mine where solutes from tailings are not allowed to cause impacts for 10,000 years. All right, so I think there's a, it's a big question, that one, but certainly it's part of my thinking on that is to say, well, yeah, that's really why I do prefer pit backfill, because I think at least you've removed the oxygen from the equation. And so, um, although sometimes you can still get arsenic mobilized in the geochemical conditions inside a pit, um, the, the overall risks, I think, are, are vastly lower than what they would be above ground. But it's, uh, it's, it's difficult. And a lot of that will be site specific as well in terms of the various risks and, and issues involved. So I could just ask a question, Gavin. Um, does the, uh, have you ever seen the case where I guess the environment uh, just adapts to these acid mine drainage discharges? I mean, you know, do you think given uh, it's going to be almost, uh, it would appear that, you know, these, a thousand years is a long time. <laughs> what do you think the environment itself may adapt and you'd get a different blend of species and perhaps that's um, 
funny you should ask that, Richard, because there is actually evidence for that. And um, uh, and there's actually evidence even at sites like Rum Jungle. And I remember in the, um, the uh, mid 2000s, I think there was a study that came out of, from some research at Ansto, basically demonstrating that fish were becoming more tolerant to copper. All right, and so they looked at the studies and looked at over time and the same species and so on, and they were able to show that, yeah, they're getting fish there in the Finnish River are getting more tolerant to copper. And there's similar research I've seen in uh, places like the Tinto region of Spain, which of course is where, where the very name Rio Tinto comes from. Um, and so, yes, that does happen. Um, now, whether that's a healthy thing for an ecosystem, whether that's something we would want, uh, that's an entirely different question. But yes, you know, nature does adapt and there's, there's issues there, but uh, I, I would sort of push that, that, you know, if you're getting that amount of exposure of metals into things like fish, uh, and then especially if you've got you know, hunter-gatherer processes like uh, people going fishing and, um, and stuff there downstream on the, uh, the, the floodplain downstream from Rum Jungle, for example, uh, that's something I think would need to be carefully assessed. So it's, um, so yeah, it, it's, there's certainly evidence for it, but it, it's something that I think it, there's a lot more questions around that need to be answered as well, not just the, the fact that therefore it happens and it's automatically a good thing. I think it, it raises just as many questions, I think, as it probably answers. Absolutely. No, just thought I'd ask. Uh, next question, uh, Alyssa Flatley. Thanks, Gavin. Yeah, Are you yeah. finding that AMD increasing with the increase in diversion of river channels for mining practices and these associated changes in surface hydrology? Um. It's hard to answer, actually. Uh, it's probably not often I'll say that, but that's um, because a lot of that, um, certainly in my experience, a lot of the AMB is typically coming from overburden dumps. It's coming from tailings dams um, or from old mines, like underground mines or open cuts, et cetera. So um, I'd qualify that because I, I'm not 100% certain that um, I know certainly there's acid mine drainage problems at um, you know, various coal mines up in the Bowen Basin, which is where there's been a lot of river diversions. Um, there's certainly acid sulfate soil issues to manage in some of the Latrobe Valley mines as well. So, um, so, but whether the fact that you're getting more river diversions is causing that, I, I don't know. I, I don't know whether that's the direct link. I'd probably say that the A and D is increasing probably more. I think the greater causal factor is really the just the sheer scale of um, uh, waste rock and overburden um, and the scale of uh, modern mine waste compared to just uh, river diversions. But certainly in some cases river diversions are, um, are associated with a, either an AMD problem or an ASS problem, like an acid sulfate soil problem. So um, hopefully I, that helps anyway, Alyssa. I think you did very well answering a question that you thought you were gonna find difficult to answer. Now we've got, uh, we're, we're pretty much out of time. It's 1.33, but I am going to give a couple of bonus questions. Uh, one to our good friend, Giuseppe Greco from, uh, Melbourne Zoo, do you have or had cases experienced where plants have been used to absorb or control heavy metals in the soil, like species such as Arundo donax or the common reed? Yeah, thanks, Giuseppe. It's an area of research that's, I suppose, getting a lot more attention lately. Like there's some, um, some folks up at, um, at uh, uh, UQ, for example, that are looking at certain um, species that absorb nickel and they're getting you know, percent levels of nickel inside the sap. So now, um, you know, the hyper accumulator you know, species, there's, there's some known for arsenic, for, um, for copper and nickel and, uh, and selenium. You know, um, you know uh, Custer, of course, um, was tricked by the, uh, the, the shoe in America, the shoe Indians to um, get his cattle, his horses, sorry, to eat uh, a certain type of grass that was known by the uh, local shoe to be poisonous because of its uh, high concentrations of selenium. So I think some of this stuff is out there and we know about it. Um, I, I think it's, I don't think it's been too many cases where it's been actively used um, overall as a treatment methodology. Um, certainly not for acid mine drainage, but it certainly can be used as part of a contaminated site remediation approach. It's, um, and I think the potential for that's probably going to get a lot better in the future as we, as we certainly understand the the potential of hyperaccumulators to uh, extract out you know, particular metals. And so that, that's certainly, a, it's potentially quite a good approach. All right. Uh, I think we'll give it three more questions. Um, I'll try and be quick. Great, it's a great credit to you, uh, 
that we continue to get so many questions coming through. So great effort. Um, next questions from another anonymous attendee. Great presentation. Have you come across any innovative techniques for acid mine drainage affected high walls if complete backfilling is impractical? Um, I suppose the quick answer to that is no. Um, high walls, uh, not an area I've done a lot of work in in coal, um, but uh, yeah, when you've got context like that, that does get very difficult. So um, I think the best way to do that is uh, send me an email and I'm happy to follow up on that um, you know, through email. Sounds good. Um, given that question's anonymous, please make sure you do send that email through. Um, Next question from Remke Van Dam. What are the challenges with and opportunities for monitoring acid mine drainage in groundwater? Surely what is seen in the creeks is only the tip of the iceberg. Yes, absolutely. I know it's a point I forgot to make. So thanks Remke. Um, when you do the mass balance at Rum Jungle in the late nineties, one of the things they realized is that uh, when you look at the, the you know, flow in the Venice River times concentration gives you uh, kilograms or tons of metals and you look at the, the same calculation from the waste rock dumps you can only account for two-thirds of the metal load in the finished river from waste rock dumps so roughly the, the expectation therefore was that one-third is coming from groundwater and so the studies that were done um, throughout the 2010s um, uh, they uh, looked at that and what they're showing is the incredible compartmentalization now uh, some people coming from a groundwater background don't like that term um, so let's just say incredible heterogeneity, right? And you could get bores that were sometimes, you know, 100 metres apart, that one was fresh, so less than 500 milligrams per litre TDS and arguably natural groundwater with no, um, basically neutral pH and low metals and so on. Um, and yet 100 metres away, you've got seawater quality with acidity and, uh, you know, metals through the roof. Um, all right, so I think um, a lot of that will come down to the, the hydrogeology of your specific site. Um, but again, it comes back to understanding uh, how your site works. So with Red Bank, for example, we know that groundwater is a critically important pathway for transport of AMD. I mean, the fact we can see it coming um, through the pit walls is, is, is pretty stark. But the other point I, um, I forgot to make with Red Bank as well is when you go along the Savannah Way and the Savannah Way actually drives across Hanrahan's Creek, uh, the, the water is polluted upstream in Hanrahan's Creek. Right, so if you've got the drainage line that comes out on the southern side of Red Bank and that drainage line goes straight down into Hanrahan's Creek, upstream of that and upstream of the Savannah Way Road, uh, the, the creek is polluted. And the only way you explain that is that because the mine and the, the waste rock dumps and everything else are on a ridge. And so a lot of the groundwater is therefore going north um, upstream into the mine and uh, polluting Hanrahan's Creek upstream. So certainly groundwater can be very critical. And, uh, and again, the extent of that will be highly variable depending on your site. But it's a it's a great point and it's something I think we often underestimate. All right. Well, unfortunately, I think that's probably where we're going to have to leave it. Um, we will email out answers to these other outstanding questions. Um, but many thanks for everyone attending today. I think it's um, amazing how many people are still on and obviously very interested in Thank your you, folks question response so many many thanks Gavin that was great and I'm sure we'll have you back again indeed but, um, I'm happy to help and I uh, look forward to it but for the folks that I didn't get a chance to answer the questions please email me and, uh, and Richard and uh, gavin.mud at rmit.edu.au and uh, happy to follow up but we'll go from there thank you thank you very much everybody and have a good yeah. day indeed cheers folks catch you around all right